part of the 2021 state law which legalized recreational marijuana and paved the way for a recreational cannabis market, policymakers greenlit an advisory board tasked with providing guidance to state regulators on a variety of cannabis issues. For more on this evolving mandate, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by the advisory board's chair, Joe Bellick. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. So for starters, what is the mission of the 13-member New York State Cannabis Advisory Board? There are a couple of different components to uh, the work that we're doing. The main one is to hand out part of the funds that the state is going to be receiving to various community groups around the state. So we are going to manage and administer the New York State Community Grants Reinvestment Fund, which was part of the cannabis law, and set up a process to receive proposals from various groups around the state to take the money that is going into the reinvestment fund and hand it out to organizations throughout New York State. And separately from that, we also have a role in advising the Office of Cannabis Management and the Cannabis Board policy. We work in collaboration with them to advise and issue recommendations to the Cannabis Control Board on the various aspects of the law, medical cannabis, adult use, uh, hemp. We have uh, 13 members of the 13, seven members are appointed by the governor the Senate and Speaker of the Assembly have three appointments each. There are some dedicated spots for various state agencies, like the Department of Labor and Department of Health. Well, you mentioned how the board is responsible for governing and administering uh, the New York State Community Grants Reinvestment Fund. Is it the case that your group will have the final word on, say, reinvesting tax revenue? Or because the board is a quote-unquote advisory board, are you making recommendations that will maybe or maybe not go into effect? So for the portion that goes into the community reinvestment fund, the advisory board has the final say in that. That is by statute something that was tasked to the advisory board and we will be developing the process and have the final say. We expect to try to work in collaboration with the governor's office, the cannabis control board, Chris Alexander, the legislature, the controller's office to make sure that we set up the right process and that The money is distributed fairly and equitably and with guidelines that make sure that the money is protected and the organizations are accountable for the money that is sent to them. And in figuring out the process for distributing revenue, how much wiggle room does the board have and how much of this processes already prescribed by state law in terms of the criteria for, say, who might be eligible for money? So I think it's a relatively wide open process. There's not a tremendous amount of guidelines in the statute um, about the fund. I think what we're planning to do, and maybe I should just step back a minute, but we are in the process of organizing the Cannabis Advisory Board into subcommittees that will look at different aspects of the work that we're doing. So one of the subcommittees is going to focus particularly on the Community Grants Reinvestment Fund and come up with guidelines for soliciting proposals and distributing the money. There are community reinvestment Uh, guidelines that already exist in state law um, and in uh, federal law. And I think there are some uh, agencies uh, like the controller's office, possibly SUNY, other places that have experience with doing grants like this and, and distributing money 
that we'll be relying on to um, come up with an appropriate process. But, you know, basically 50 percent of the money is going to go into this reinvestment fund. So eventually there will be a lot of money in it that we need to make sure is distributed in the appropriate way. We say eventually retail markets are just now getting up and running in New York. So what is the timeline for both getting a big pot of state marijuana revenue together and then getting that money out the door to different organizations and communities? So obviously, you know, as you said, the the dispensaries are coming online. You know, the revenue is going to be increasing. I think we expect that we will have uh, funds to distribute this year. And again, we want to make sure that we get the right process set up. But I would expect that before the end of the year, we will have a process in place and have money that is being uh, distributed out to people uh, and organizations. So we want to make sure we get it right with the process. Um, So we're going to take our time to do that. But I I think that by the end of the year, um, you know, we we will have a good process in place and have money flowing out. Well, for listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're speaking with Joe Bullock, chair of the New York Cannabis Advisory Board. And in terms of steering money from marijuana sales, why is a solicitation or RFP process the best way to go about distributing money as opposed to the Cannabis Advisory Board proactively trying to identify who might be worthy recipients? Because I have to imagine there are some organizations who are going to be good at applying for this type of money and other organizations that might not have the infrastructure or awareness about this process. So can you talk a little bit about those challenges? You know, everybody is aware of the social equity uh, goals that are part of uh, our cannabis law. You know, there are a variety of guidelines that are in the statute, you know, related to communities that were disproportionately affected by previous drug policies um, and areas like education and mental health and uh, child care and um, nutrition uh, that that are identified, uh, women's health, community-based uh, services. Uh, so I think it's our view that uh, having a some type of RFP process or application process will open it up to the widest variety uh, and and widest number of potential organizations. Um, you know, obviously, there are going to be some organizations that have an infrastructure more skilled at doing this. But, um, you know, our, I think our intention is to try to provide uh, an easy, straightforward process that lets a, a wide swath of organizations in New York apply. Um, we're going to come up with some criteria and how to rank those and distribute the money um, and, uh, you know, whether it's some type of pro rata approach or uh, some type of ranking, you know, I think it are some of the issues we're going to think through. Uh, and as I mentioned, we want to make sure that the organizations that get the money are uh, capable of managing it, handling it responsibly, doing any type of financial reporting or auditing uh, that is necessary so that, you know, we can have some level of comfort that the money is going to be used for the purposes it's being requested. Right now, as we talk in early April, how would you describe the relationship between your board and state cannabis regulators? So I think the relationship has been uh, been very good. Um, you know, we got set up uh, a little bit behind the Cannabis Control Board, and uh, they had already uh, started uh, well down the road of uh, setting up an infrastructure and regulatory process. Um, but since the Cannabis Advisory Board has been fully appointed and started meeting, there's been a very good flow of information 
uh, between the two entities. And uh, they have been very receptive to feedback uh, from the Cannabis Advisory Board. There's an extensive uh, amount of expertise uh, on the Cannabis Advisory Board. Uh, we have a uh, physician, we have uh, union representatives, we have uh, growers, we have people who uh, are seeking retail licenses, we have uh, social justice advocates, lawyers, and uh, when discussions have taken place, about regulations or proposed regulations. It's been a very collegial and good exchange of information. I think that the advisory board is very uh, focused on also being an independent uh, entity and not just being a rubber stamp for the control board. And I think the control board is actually welcomes uh, that type of input uh, and advice. and. You know, there may be things that uh, the advisory board's view is different than the control board. And I think that the advisory board won't be shy about expressing that. But um, right now, it's a very collegial uh, um, interaction. And they've been doing a lot of work to help us set up our infrastructure and subcommittees and uh, meeting schedule and things like that. And after a quick break, we'll have more with Joe Bullock, chair of the New York Cannabis Advisory Board. Support for the Capital Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. You're listening to the Capital Press Room, and we're continuing our conversation with Joe Bullock, chair of the New York Cannabis Advisory Board. And before the break, we were talking about the relationship between the Cannabis Advisory Board and state cannabis regulators, including the Office of Cannabis Management. Is there benchmark or test of this relationship coming up in the near future where you'll be able to gauge whether, for example, the Office of Cannabis Management or the Cannabis Control Board is actually incorporating ideas and suggestions from your cannabis advisory board? Yeah, I mean, I think that that has actually already happened. You know, some of it is very much in the weeds of certain regulations and things re related to labeling and, you know, warnings and uh, things like that. But they have shown a, a willingness to listen, respond, make changes where they think it's warranted. Um, it has definitely not been the type of relationship where people on the advisory board have submitted comments or questions and they haven't gotten a very substantive response and there hasn't been a substantive conversation about um, incorporating those changes into things. So my expectation is that will continue. Again, we are an independent organization. We may not always agree uh, with everything that the control board does, but I think there's a willingness for both entities to try to work together to come up with the strongest possible set of regulations and to operate the program in, in the way that's the most successful. A lot of people on the advisory board, like myself, who have been involved in the legalization movement for, in some cases, like me, over 30 years, we want nothing other than this program to be successful. And I think everybody shares a singular focus on making this uh, program successful in the state of New York. We've been waiting a long, long time for this opportunity, and we need to make sure we get it right. We just sort of teed up my next question. How did you end up on the board? Can you talk a bit about your background in cannabis? When uh, 
I enrolled at uh, SUNY Binghamton in 1985. Um, I set up a, a chapter at Binghamton of an organization called Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. At that time, it was the main and probably only organization in the country pushing for legalization. I set up a chapter at Binghamton called SUNY Be Normal and started advocating for legalization at that point and in various ways have continued to do that over the last 30 years. You know, 1985 was a different time. We were in, in the middle of a, of a war on cannabis and other drugs. Advocating for legalization wasn't a popular thing. It was, it was uh, something that brought you the attention of uh, law enforcement and other people. Um, but it was uh, part of a long process to get where we are today. When Governor Cuomo was governor, I informally and formally advocated for legalization with his administration and was eventually pointed to a volunteer position at the New York State Department of Health, uh, working on some of the labeling and other areas that eventually became the cannabis law in New York. And when Governor Hochul became governor, uh, I reached out to her staff and let them know of my interest uh, continuing to help the state administration on cannabis legalization. And um, the result was my being appointed to the Cannabis Advisory Board. And the board elects the chair. So a couple of months ago in January, we had a meeting and my fellow board members elected me to be chair. As I said, this has been uh, a long, long time effort, a uh, lifelong passion of mine and um, very honored to be in this role and going to try to do everything we can to make sure this program is successful. Well, someone who's been an advocate in this space, both while marijuana was basically a prohibited substance in New York and retail sales were banned and now it's legal to consume marijuana if you're an adult and now there's options for retail sales of marijuana. How do you think the state should approach the illegal sales that are going on right now? Should the approach be akin to what was happening before 2021? Does it need to be different? What are your thoughts on this? Because it's a issue that's really seemed to perplex and stump a, a lot of state policymakers so far. Yeah, and I think it's a very good question and a very difficult issue. There are a lot of features of the law, such as those that will eventually allow people to grow a certain number of plants at home and things like that, that may make some of these choices easier as the program rolls out. But I am an attorney by training, and I believe in the rule of law. We now have a law, and I think in a lot of ways, it's probably the most progressive cannabis legislation in the country in terms of its delivery components, uh, allowing on-site usage at, at venues and things like that. Possession limits are very high. The home growing piece, we are very fortunate in New York. We have a very, very progressive law and a law that's more progressive, I think, than almost any other state, including the forerunners of this, like Colorado and California. So I think we need to live with that law and crack down on illegal sales, certainly dispensaries that are not licensed, operating illegally. You know, we need to do what we can to enforce the law, shut them down, let the legal dispensaries uh, function and develop. I think some of the things about law enforcement possession, we're going to have to sort out. But for now, we need to give this law a chance and take advantage of all the progressive features in it. If changes or tweaks need to be made, I think the legislature has shown a, a willingness to be thoughtful about this, and the governor has, and we'll make those changes. But is it clear to you what it means to, quote unquote, crack down on illegal retail sales, since 
so much of what was driving the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act was this idea that we wanted to limit uh, criminalization tied with marijuana? In terms of the dispensaries, yes. I think if you don't have a license from the control board, you shouldn't have a storefront, you shouldn't be operating a food truck, you shouldn't be making sales uh, like that. Uh, I understand that you know there, there may need to be some changes in the law to enhance the enforcement components, but I think everybody involved with this wants a safe, successful market. And if you have unlicensed people operating businesses without the appropriate regulatory structure, I'm a product liability attorney mm -hmm. by training. And we don't tolerate in the society, uh, or we shouldn't, unchecked sales of certain types of pharmaceuticals, medical devices, chemicals. And uh, it's important that we have a safe market and a, a viable market. So there may be some lack of clarity in the enforcement part, uh, but I think you know, that the right changes will be made. Uh, but I think a strong message has to be sent that we want the licensed dispensaries to be the ones that people are using and uh, that the other ones should not be able to operate. Well, we've been speaking with Joe Billick. He is the chair of the New York Cannabis Advisory Board. Joe, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. I uh, enjoyed my time with you. Support for Capital Press Room provided by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation. Communities across the Empire State have stories to tell. A roadside marker funded by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation can help your town or city educate the public, encourage pride of place, and promote local tourism. More about the Pomeroy Foundation's New York State Historic Marker Grant Program for 501c3 organizations, nonprofit academic institutions, and local state and federal government entities at wgpfoundation.org.